like we're all going to fit on that couch, right? So we're getting no, cozy. Getting cozy. <laughs> Fantastic. Well done. Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it is the first time you'll see four people on this couch, maybe the last time as well. I am honored and delighted to moderate this panel of these very um, effective and, and obviously successful um, benefits managers. Each of these individuals is managing an organization's benefits um, from a very unique and diverse um, standpoint. So I'd like, in order for us to put their comments today in context, for us to understand their backgrounds and the organizations that they are supporting. Sure, thank you. My name is Stephen Flavel. I am the Director of Benefits Compensation and Immigration at Overstock. Um, I've been at Overstock for about two years. I actually came from the East Coast. I was with a Fortune 200 company in New York. Uh, so my move across the country has been uh, very, very unique, and it has been very successful and rewarding to be at Overstock for the last uh, two years. Hi, everybody. Angela Mitchell. I work for Intel's Benefits Department, and I lead uh, what we have designed as our own accountable care organization is called Connected Care. So we're directly contracting with healthcare systems. Um, before that, was working in the healthcare industry for a little over eight years, working on patient-centered medical home redesign. So really, from the ground up, how can we really uh, create that preventive focus for healthcare and engagement um, in a patient population? Uh, happy to be here. Thank you, Angela. My name is Doug Yonker. For the last 27 years, I was the director of uh, HR for Icon Health and Fitness. A couple of months ago, I decided to take an early exit and teach some of the things that we had created uh, on the Icon Medical Plan that you'll hear about uh, during you know, the presentation. My name is John Holbert. I'm delighted to be here today with you. I'm the current HR director and uh, legal counsel for Icon Health and Fitness. Before transitioning into this role, I was on the uh, legal department exclusively in the, the um, realm of uh, transactional and product liability. So I'm relatively new to the benefit space. And before joining ICON about seven years ago, I worked for a couple of federal appellate judges. Great. I'm James Morton. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. I'm with eBay, and I've been with eBay for about two and a half years, uh, focusing on our U.S. healthcare programs. Uh, before my time at eBay, I was at Twitter for three years uh, doing similar work, uh, and before that at Yahoo uh, for five years uh, doing similar work. So uh, I have a lot to share, I hope, uh, in regards to what we're doing at eBay. It's, it's uh, kind of a special time at eBay. Uh, we were about two Three years ago, we separated from PayPal. So at that time, we were a 30,000 employee company in the US. Uh, today, we find ourselves at 7,000 employees and focused on changing our culture. And with that, uh, we want to change employee experience in around uh, how our employees and our members engage with benefits. And so I want to share that with you today. Fantastic. So I know we've, we've had a few calls leading up to today's panel and talked about the different stories and implementations that you have relative to whether it's innovation or consumerization of, of health benefit. And I think we'll start with you, Steve, and if you could also give us some context in terms of where your employees are located, if they're on a central location, and how many that you're managing. Sure, sure, thank you. So uh, Overstock is primarily located, at least our corporate headquarters are in Salt Lake City, Utah. We have about 2,200 employees uh, across the United States and, uh, and abroad, but about 85% are in Salt Lake in a number of locations. We have some other larger locations in New York City, uh, New Jersey, and now in Washington State. And then we've got a, a, a pretty large operation for our software development in Ireland. So I think all of us today will be sharing with you some unique aspects of what we've done at our, at our respective companies to uh, offer benefits and, and, and different items for our employees to better their, better their lives and, of course, as, as benefits professionals to make sure that we control our costs and we continue to offer benefits to our employees. Uh, when I got to Overstock about two years ago, uh, we had a unique... Uh, position in our company's history. We had been designing and we, are, we were designing a new corporate campus that obviously in our history is once in a lifetime. The company is about 20 years old. So what we had decided to do 
is to take some of the aspects of the physicality, the physical nature of our campus and our building, and complement what we do in our benefits. So we have about a 19-acre campus, and roughly it's rectangular. Uh, so uh, we've decided to do a number of things to get people, our 1,800 people in that, in that campus, moving and, and moving around and walking. And you know, if you're, in a, if you're in a very tall building, you go up and down an elevator, you may uh, have Skype or conference calls, and you don't really go talk to people. You don't move around talking to people. So we are really getting people to move around all day. So the first thing we did is we put our parking structure on one far end of the 19 acres, <laughs> and we put our building on the other end. So we have about a 200-yard walk, about two football fields, to get from the parking garage to our building. Uh, so, and that's at least twice a day for most people. Uh, so we are getting people to move around. We built our main building in, in a, it's literally a coliseum. It's a round building. So we call it the Peace Coliseum because on the outside it's a three-story uh, rendition or at least modern rendition of the Coliseum in Rome. And we call it the Peace Coliseum because our, our nucleus building in the middle of the building uh, has walkways in. So if you see it from an airplane, it looks like a peace sign. <laughs> <laughs> we decided to build it three stories and not six or seven and make it smaller. Um, reason being is we wanted people to use stairs and we want people to walk around the building. So we have about 240,000 square foot building and we have stairs all over the place and they're wide open and at each level we have congregation spaces that are in between. So it gets people to get out of their chairs and off their sit-stand desks and to go and congregate and to talk and to meet with people. Uh, we also took our elevators and obviously we need elevators, but we've also tucked them away to encourage people to use the stairs. We want people moving around. Um, so a couple other things that we've been doing there in our, in our new building, in our new campus, is we built an amenities building. So we have a gym. We have a massage uh, station for that. We have a daycare. And we have a medical center that we built. Uh, on the other side of the property, we built a, a, a 9,000 square foot greenhouse. So tell it, why does that all mean anything? So what we wanted to do first, we want, we've, brought in partners for uh, some of those different facilities. So we partnered with a great company to staff our medical center. And the doctor, our doctor is on staff 40 hours a week. Um, she uh, does lunch and learns with our staff uh, once a month. She actually works with our chef in our cafe and comes up with healthy lunch entrees and sandwiches that we then post and we then sub, uh, subsidize throughout our cafe, because we obviously want people to, to eat healthy. Uh, one of the other things that we do is we have the greenhouse. So we like to be able to make sure that the food that's coming in and served to our employees on a daily basis, as much as we can, uh, we know that it, it's, it's going to be fresh and healthy. So we supply all of the fruits and vegetables from our greenhouse to our cafe. And we know it's uh, organic, and we know what goes into it, and we then sell it to our cafe. So a lot of the physical nature that we had the unique opportunity to, we've incorporated into the building and um, we want it to be part of our healthy culture. Our CEO and founder, um, his number one uh, mantra is he wants his employees to be very happy and very healthy. And one of the ways that we were able to do that is with this new building is to put some of those unique physical uh, items into our building. Uh, we have trainers that are on site every day, and we actually offer fitness classes at our, at our uh, fitness center free of charge to all of our employees throughout the day at different times of the day when they can feel as if they can get away and do a yoga class or do a Pilates class or a strength class. So we really are encouraging our employees to get up, get moving around, and talk to other people, but at the same time, we want them moving around. As a matter of fact, we have right now four or five signs that we are, we are printing up, and they're going to go in just like a parking sign, but at different parts of our building, it's going to tell them how many steps they walk to get to our main building. Mm -hmm. We're encouraging people to get up and move, and that's just 
um, I think, unique opportunity that we had uh, for this. We're all offering great benefits and unique benefits, but we had that unique opportunity to do this with, with our new building. Uh, so we hope, as we've been in the building about a year now, that we're starting to get data coming in, and we hope in the next year when we come back here, we'll be able to give you some data to show you how what we've done has been helping and, and impacting our medical costs uh, for the last year. Um, I think at this point I'm going to bring it over to Angela and let her talk to you about Intel. Is that okay, Trisha? That's great. I can't wait to hear <laughs> <Okay. that. laughs> So your, your organization and, and structure is quite different. Angela and, and the industry. Just a little, yeah. Just a little, right? Um, so Intel, I'll start with the amount of employees, similar kind of story. Yeah. So we have over um, 100,000 employees uh, globally, but 50,000 in the United States. Our main uh, campuses is New Mexico, is the smallest, and then we have Oregon, which is the largest, and then Arizona, which is right, right next to the size of Oregon. And then uh, right here in the Silicon Valley, we have our headquarters, as, where, as well as in the Folsom uh, area in California. So what we did, we, we do a lot of things to provide very rich benefits for our employees and families at Intel. Uh, but what I'm going to focus on is really what we decided to do from the benefit design um, area of, of uh, offering benefits to our employees. So uh, years ago, uh, and it took a very um, innovative thought leader, um, Tammy Graham, uh, to go to the vice president of HR and really ask for some additional funding to start to innovate and be disruptive in the healthcare benefit space. The reason being is because, as all we all know as employers, uh, a pretty small percentage of our population represents a pretty large chunk of our spend because of mismanagement, uh, duplication and testing, misdiagnosis. Uh, and folks that are just in general really, really sick and maybe not having that high touch care coordination uh, that we know would really help them and benefit them. But in the, in the you know, years ago, uh, we didn't really have the influence and the, and the seat at the table with the healthcare systems and the actual providers uh, to make a difference in that regard. So what we decided to do was uh, be innovative and disruptive for the right reasons and directly contract locally with healthcare systems that we knew were providing good care, uh, maybe could be providing better care, and uh, go ahead and, and bring the insurance side of the healthcare plan to a pretty minimal scope of really just claims administration and a concierge approach, of course, uh, so that at least when you do call, a human answers the phone, uh, and, and it's a dedicated team just for our population. So uh, we've done that now in all four states. Um, they hired me to come in in the very beginning to help uh, kind of be the design and architect behind these uh, high quality, high performing networks. And happy to say we have over 38,000 covered lives in those four states today. Uh, we do not force folks to join these plans. We uh, offer them up as an option. And because they do have a smaller amount of providers compared to our other national plans on the table, that's one of the biggest choices and decisions that folks have to make when they join is, is my doctor in or out? And uh, being, being from a, a broad network, uh, you can have doctors from many different healthcare systems, as you guys know. So um, we have uh, actually Stanford, John Jackson's here today, and he's going to be presenting with me later on what that partnership means from an employer to a provider. Uh, because it's unique, and uh, it comes with its great opportunities, and it also comes with its challenges, as anything that's innovative. And, um, and we're seeing some really great results. You know, one of the key differentiators between what we do, um, you know, that no other large employer in the United States is doing is holding them accountable for quality um, and outcomes and a pay for performance dynamic. So there's an actual upside and a downside uh, dynamic going on that's allowing for that pressure and influence to really start to uh, push these healthcare systems to think differently about how can we uh, provide better care, uh, give that high touch to our chronic populations, but then also think about the folks that have never even been to a doctor before. We have a pretty young, healthy, tech-savvy population um, who doesn't go to the doctor until they have to. So we're really trying to encourage them from a primary care preventive standpoint to get in, at least have a relationship so that should you get sick, uh, at least you have that uh, you know, patient-centered medical home kind of foundation to catch you if you fall down. Um, but yeah, things are going really well. I'm going to share some data later um, that we're actually saving dollars and we're watching our chronic population get healthier. And uh, we're watching patient satisfaction in the 90%. Uh, 
range, and we're also seeing retention in these plans when they could leave each year if they want to, over 90% as well. Um, so we're proud about this work, and uh, thanks again to the leadership at Intel for really fighting for this and, and starting to think differently about how can we as a large employer really start to have an impact on our spend and the inflation we were seeing that was getting out of control, as we all know in this room. Fantastic. Angela, thank you so much. We look forward to that data later as well, some more context sure. to that. I have a slide on it. Okay, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> so Doug, you were with Icon for many decades, lots of experience, and really a market leader in, in the smaller state of Utah um, in that way. Can you give us some background on that? Okay. Well, thank you uh, for this opportunity to, to talk a little bit about what we've created at Icon. And my CFO, probably like everyone in this room, 20-ish years ago, came to me and said, Doug, our healthcare spend is out of control. Do something. And I said, we're doing, all, we're doing what everyone else is doing with all of these great innovative ideas. And it was like, it isn't enough. Bring me something more. So that started me really on about a 20-year adventure of looking out of the box at innovative ideas. And I'm going to go in reverse order. About three and a half years ago, a gentleman came to me that had this highly discounted surgical solution. And I said, well, we've been doing international medical tourism. I heard somebody talk about that later today. It's a hard sell. He says, no, you can stay in your home community, and we have top-end surgeons and surgery centers and hospitals. Now, I'm going to tell, Andrea started off with some stories, so I'm going to tell a story around this space. One of these, uh, a young man in our group needed a total jaw reconstruction. We priced it out using, quote, our discount networks, $43,000. And I thought, well, that seems reasonable. We partnered with this surgical group, and they brought us a $22,000 solution, board certified maxillofacial surgeon. We called, this is creating an employee engagement in consumerism. So the employee comes to me and says, Doug, let's move to the $22,000 solution. But call and cancel my surgery for my son. So we called the surgical center and said, we're moving. And I got a question, why? We said, well, we found a much better price. And she says, why do you care what it costs? You guys have insurance. It will be covered. Is, I mean, how often do we hear that? And so I briefly explained self-funding, and if whatever my employee doesn't pay, I pay the rest. And then she said, well, we could do that here for $9,500. Oh, my gosh. And we went, bought. <laughs> so we've done that maybe 14 or 15 times, saved Icon over $300,000, and we don't charge our employees typically a copay or a deductible for making that choice. I should have said, out of the last five, out of the last six years, Icon's medical trend has been flat to negative. The only year it went up, unfortunately, we offshored 400 jobs, and those employees went out and spent more money. The year after that, our costs dropped again. So we've had a flat medical spend. The second story kind of has a sad element to it, but it, I think it has a silver lining. Thirteen years ago, a gentleman called me whose son worked for us, and he said, my son tells me there's an easy way to get pain meds through the Icon medical plan. HR people don't want to hear that news, right? <laughs> that my medical plan is subsidizing pain medication that shouldn't be. I called my PBM, and they said, no problems, Doug. Your plan looks just fine. Two years later, that same father called me and said, my son just died on an oxysoma overdose. And I was like, I did something about, I didn't do anything about it two years ago. I called. So this time I call again, same story, Doug, your plan looks fine. I was a little more adamant. I asked for the data, and they sent me an Excel spreadsheet with 23,000 lines of data in it. Fifteen minutes later, I found the problem. Two physicians were prescribing 90% of all the Schedule II narcotics. One of them was a pain specialist. I get it. The other one was a general practitioner prescribing 45% of all the pain meds. I did a little more research. Uh, Oxy was designed as a final stage cancer drug, highly addictive. The manufacturer of that drug pled guilty to fraud in its marketing schemes. 
and paid a $634 million fine. So we ended up writing a program to appropriately control Oxy and it's that category. And it, it wasn't necessarily easy because pharmacists disagreed with me, doctors were disagreeing with me, and I said, but I, I want to fix this. Well, that was 13 years ago. A couple of weeks ago, I was driving from my home to Salt Lake City. Uh, the radio said, every 11 minutes, somebody dies in America on an oxy overdose. So six months later, that PBM calls me and says, Doug, can we use your protocols for other companies? And I should have patented the, the idea. <laughs> um, the next story, this one happened eight years, started eight years ago. My, one of my VPs came to me who John reports to now. He says, Doug, I've got really severe tendonitis. I don't want surgery. I've looked into platelet-rich plasma or PRP and stem cell injections. Could we do this? We engaged with a sports medicine MD who'd been doing it for a couple of years with great success. We sent this vice president down along with handfuls of other employees, anything from rotator cuffs, tennis elbows, hips, joints, and we've had phenomenal success. Avoiding surgeries and we're spending two to three thousand dollars per situation versus tens and twenties. How many of you out there deal with FMLA? Then you're not in HR if you're not dealing with FMLA. <laughs> the nice thing about this, they're not out of work for a week or a month or two. It's a basic injection, taking out your own blood, your own uh, stem cells out of your adipose fat or bone marrow, and it's just injected back into the site of the injury and healing processes take place. Okay, last story. Uh, this is the one that kind of started the whole cascade of looking outside the box. So after my CFO challenged me to fix it, I ended up reading an article entitled Natural Remedies That Really Work. And it talked about how in Europe and other countries, natural medicine is prescribed by physicians. It works. There's science behind it. And I think we heard it talked about earlier today, we spend in America twice as much as every other country, and we don't get as good a results as they get. So the thought might be, what are they doing that we're not doing that we could be doing? And so I jumped into this really strange world 18 years ago, and we did a pilot study. I heard somebody mention, you don't do it for everybody all the time. Everything we've done, we've started with little pilot studies. We tracked 25 employees over an entire year's period, and we measured. Angela challenged me <laughs> to come up with you know, the facts. So I went back to a report that we did 18 years ago, and these are the numbers. That group, and this, this is a group of employees that had chronic long-term medical conditions that were seeking medical care. And we sent them to these alternative doctors that were using homeopathy, vitamin, mineral supplementation. After doing that, their symptoms, self-reported, dropped 75%. The children who went, as reported by their parents, their symptoms dropped 93%. Some people just got off their drugs that they had been on for years. And the savings were $10.40 for every dollar that we spent in that non-traditional model. I would never go back to just having one model. My employees, I kind of, sorry John, they're your employees now, but, but my employees had this whole option of everything the traditional model, model brings, which is very valuable and it's very needed. And they have this other entire model of homeopathy, vitamin supplementation, stem cell, PRP, et cetera, et cetera. So do you have to swim upstream sometimes? Absolutely. Do you have to disagree with some people? Absolutely. You're not cavalier. You're not making really crazy decisions. You start off small. And I heard him, I'll end with a, a quote from a medical doctor that I truly respect. He said when he graduated from medical school, the graduating class was told, you guys are really smart and you know a lot. But keep your eyes and ears open because there will be a lot of new things coming down the pipe in years to come. I think ICON discovered some of those things very early, was an, earlier adopt, an early adopter to a lot of these non-traditional solutions, 
and it has saved us, I think, millions of dollars, but maybe more important, and we heard it earlier, it's the human experience. It's the employee and the child of the employee who's not chronically sick because you gave him some options. So that's what we've been doing at ICON, and it was so crazy I decided I'll go do it on my own. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Doug. And John, you're now managing this population. You're kind of evolving the, the benefit structure. So help us understand what that looks like today. Thank you. Yeah, it's been interesting from my perspective. I came from a legal background into the HR space, as I mentioned before. And I approached these uh, non-traditional things with a pretty healthy dose of skepticism. I was surprised early on to see the the demand from our employees for this and also the frequency in which I would receive calls from uh, employers when one of our employees would move to a different position with a different company. And the, they would begin demanding or at least requesting this type of benefit at their new employer. And I was also warned that if I did anything to mess it up, they would tar and feather me. <laughs> <laughs> and run me out of the company. So uh, it's, been, it's been interesting. We've tried to accommodate new requests for different things uh, the employees become aware of. So uh, recently we've began having DEXA body scans on site at our facility, which is a uh, low radiation x-ray, which will allow um, very detailed information about body, body mass, um, bone density, limb length discrepancies, et cetera, so that if our employees are interested in improving their health or even um, increasing their ability to be competitive in different uh, athletic events, they can use that information as well. Uh, but our, our company is uniquely situated because we make fitness products and equipment. Now, some of our brands include Nordic Track, Free Motion, uh, Weeder, Proform, et cetera. And one major emphasis right now is on technology and integrating technology with uh, large pieces of exercise equipment. If you have a wearable that's tied to a, a GPS um, component, you, know, you don't really get any benefit if you're running on a treadmill because you've stayed in a static location. And we're working on curating content for this experience on a, a treadmill elliptical that provides an interaction with other uh, consumers or with uh, talented world-class trainers that can provide uh, a cross-training option as opposed to just running on a treadmill for an extended period of time. The uh, matrix that we're currently tracking with, with um, our software include you know, the activity level that someone has during their day and encouraging them to move on a regular basis. Sitting is the new smoking. You know, it's been known for several years. The exercise that they're doing, allowing them to participate in a robust number of, of activities and, and interests, pursuing those. The um, sleep that someone gets can depend or can impact their quality of life. And uh, one thing that we do is through this curated content is we can control the amount of exercise we recommend to an individual based on their quality of sleep and um, their, their nutrition intake as well. So we're providing really a mechanism to coach individuals, and that's what it's called, um, on what they should do next based on wherever they're currently um, at and what their long-term objectives are. And we're trying to incentivize that long-term healthy behavior by removing some of the obstacles that people face. They like to you know, enter in their um, nutrition intake, but no one likes to admit all of the food <laughs> that they eat or all of the <laughs> snacks and different things. So creating ways to have, um, to remove some of that internal bias that you might have uh, when, you're, when you're recording that information. Um, and then we try to incentivize employees to, as, as Doug mentioned, take uh, supplements and, and other uh, things that are available around them. So we subsidize um, 
nutritional products. Uh, we have a, uh, our own uh, brand of uh, nutrition that they can, they can purchase um, or that we can give to our employees. Um, essentially, it's, it's um, matched to the activity and sleep and nutrition that they're doing. So uh, each month they get a um, special blend of, of protein mixes that they're encouraged to have at a different uh, time if they elect into this, this option. And it's customized. So one month it may be uh, slightly different than another month and then they can control that uh, progress or their journey a little bit more along those lines. So it's something that we're constantly aware of and trying to offer to consumers and to our own, own employees. Fantastic. Thank you. And you have a unique opportunity in doing that. So I'm sure your employees are or benefited tremendously from that, from that kind of structure. So James, tell us a little bit about the evolution, the changes that have occurred at eBay and how you've approached the sure. benefit structure there. So uh, at eBay, we have about 7,000 employees in the US, uh, 7,000 outside the US and about 35 different countries. Um, with the change in eBay, with the separation from PayPal, um, there was also a change of culture uh, and so that culture change required different organizations within the company to also support that, uh, really around experiences. And so in Benefits HR, we wanted to focus on uh, the employee experience and really what part of the employee experience was important to us. Uh, and at that time, we identified it as access, just access to care. You know, when we wanted to focus on the people that didn't have a provider, that didn't know what to do. Uh, so really, you know, 80% of the population might be healthy and not even seek healthcare or not even interact with the healthcare system. But there's that 20% that does need the help. And so we wanted to focus on uh, an organization that can provide or direct people to the right places. Uh, so we did partner with Collective Health. Uh, they have a powerful member advocacy model where uh, they, employees will get one member advocate all the time because of the, the phone ID. And that member advocate can stay uh, with the employer member for a long conversation. And also, um, the Collective Health is also open to different program partners that we put in place. So we've decided to also reach out to the different uh, tech companies that are new. Uh, Chris from Mercer talked about all these innovative products coming up into place. And so we wanted to look for them. You know, what kind of solutions did we need? We knew we had problems with mental health and access to counselors and therapists. And so we were, we were able to find an organization called Lyra Health uh, that helped uh, really triage uh, our members, figure out, hey, exactly what you need, and get them to the right therapist at the, same, at the right time, even making that appointment, making sure that the employee sees the right provider. Because sometimes if you a normal EAP or a regular EAP, you get a list of names, you make a few phone calls, some of them aren't on the list anymore, uh, I could take you in three months, but Lyra Health really helped employees to uh, make that appointment. Uh, we also partnered with Grand Rounds, an organization uh, Rusty will be speaking after us. Uh, they do the expert opinion, but we also wanted their office visit service. So mainly, if I didn't have a specialist, I didn't have a primary care physician, I can give them a call, and then I'll be able to get that appointment, or they can make that appointment for me. We also partner with different organizations like uh, Progeny, which does infertility services. Uh, we also partnered with Vita Health that does one-on-one -on -one coaching uh, for nutrition or even something as extreme as uh, diabetic management or something like that. Uh, so we wanted to put all these organizations together and Collective Health is able to be the hub for that. So if I call Collective Health, really at that moment that matters for me, hey, I just got a cancer diagnosis, hey, I, you know, I, I don't know, what, you know, I don't know what, what kind of doctor I need for a skin problem, is it a dermatologist or is it an EMT, uh, ear, nose, and throat? So, so the Collective Health member advocate will be able to have that conversation with me, uh, calm me down, uh, and then really then becomes the, because it's that moment that matters for me, I'm more, I'm more wary to be that teachable moment. So uh, the member advocate can say, hey, you know, eBay offers you grand rounds where you can get an expert opinion. Hey, eBay offers you Lyra Health, so if you're having some problems around needing therapy, you can go ahead 
here's their number, uh, or eBay offers you, uh, you know, coaching for nutrition through Vita Health. So really, we want that. You know, I, I don't want to call it a one-stop shop with with Collective Health. I think th what we're trying to create is this ecosystem that Collective Health is in the middle of, but the whole ecosystem is really the one-stop shop because we tell Lira Health, we tell Vita Health, we tell Grand Rounds that, hey, if somebody calls you and then they are talking about therapy or something like that, get them to the right organization or get them to Collective Health so that that employee has that best experience. So we're trying to create that employee experience. Around that is really technology. Uh, we want to be able to use great technology that's wonderful, that is easy to use for the employee, but if they get stuck in it, they should be able to call someone and then have that empathetic ear at the other side to help them out. Uh, so those are the things that we were looking for and we put in place uh, January 1st. Uh, and we're still kind of still looking at the results, still looking at the connectivities because, of course, there's sometimes it gets miscommunicated or, or gets to somewhere else that it shouldn't go to. But we do uh, want to make sure that our collective health partners are the ones in the center knowing all the different organizations we're partnered with. And we continue to look at different technology solutions or these point solutions uh, that are important for us. We know what our top five cost drivers are, and we want to be able to uh, provide those uh, support organizations, those technological, technological organizations that can support us. Fantastic. What a broad range of approaches to the benefit structure. I, I do want to leave a little bit of time. I'm not quite sure on the clock there, but I think we're just under 10 minutes for any um, questions or, or comments from the audience. And I see a hand here. We have a microphone, sorry. Thanks, everybody. My name is Mark uh, from Canada, so pre pleasure having me here. <laughs> uh, my question was for Angela. With regards to the employees that are using the pay for performance model of care, uh -huh. are you using PROMS, which are patient reported outcome measures, to help measure and quantify success? Are you asking the patients if they feel healthy, or is there other? So we do have a member experience component to our pay for performance model. Think of it like the triple aim. So we do, we measure on quality outcomes and those are all nationally based and recognized uh, metrics that these healthcare systems and providers are reporting for uh, Medicare and Medicaid today, but we have our benchmark on our own population. So those targets are much more aggressive. Um, and then we have member experience and we also have um, access to care um, and cost reduction. So it's, it's kind of that overarching triple aim approach. For member experience, we do, uh, again, what, what the providers are already needing to report through CMS today it, through their um, patient satisfaction scores. So we choose a couple. Uh, not every healthcare system that I work with has the exact same, but for the most part, what we're asking for is outcomes specifically on uh, quality of experience, overall experience, and then quality with provider experience. Um, and some have access to care, uh, which is always a tough one. <laughs> um, but overall, uh, we use it just for our own employees in these plans uh, and what they're saying. So yes, we benchmark um, and gather data uh, with regards to it in that pay for performance model. Great question, thank, thank you. Hi, I'm Amy Fellows. Um, I'm part of the National Open Notes team with my colleague Liz that just disappeared. But um, <laughs> we're encouraging, we're a movement encouraging transparency for patients to get easy access to the provider chart notes. And I know at your Hillsborough campus, mm -hmm. it, Angela, um, that you have clinics on campus. I, I wasn't we sure do. If you do at your others. And um, We've been trying to work with Greenway, who I think you're still using, about <laughs> letting, getting them to allow that kind of access. Um, so I just wanted to kind of find out more about, do you have that same model at all your campuses? And For our on-site clinics? On -site yeah, clinics. We, we, not all of them. Not here in the state of California, but we do in New Mexico, Oregon, and Arizona. Uh, one of the first uh, challenges that I was asked to try and overcome was in, in a high quality uh, integrated model, how are we going to get these clinics on site? Oregon was the first state to truly integrate clinically um, as well as uh, with data interoperability. So what you're talking about exactly. Uh, yes, Greenway is the EHR system that our on site clinics are using. There's two of them uh, in the Oregon campus. And uh, our healthcare system partners were both on different versions of Epic. 
Uh, so we uh, came to the table. This is another thing as a large employer that's a benefit uh, in this dynamic is getting to really push for what you as a company are passionate about. And Intel is obviously very interested in big data, figuring out ways to securely transfer data, and then obviously bringing that data to the providers and the patients themselves to be more activated in their care experience. So we figured out solutions that were national standards that were already out there, uh, that meaningful use had already required healthcare systems to use, but none of them were using it. So direct messaging is one way we do that, and then also uh, through the Sequoia project through an e-health exchange platform. Now providers and patients are getting the data in their hands at the moment of care, so that uh, there isn't any mishaps, because uh, we all know as patients ourselves, who can remember the last time you saw your provider, what they said to you, what they told you to do that you maybe did or didn't do, um, as well as your medication list, and it goes on and on, right? So uh, we did figure out how to, how to um, overcome that challenge because of the fact that we went to the table and figured out how to do it. And just so you guys know, as you can imagine, we asked the healthcare systems that we partnered with, what is your solution? to figuring this out, clinically integrating care and, and, and data with our on-site uh, providers. And they said, well, we wanna just take over your clinics. <laughs> and we said, no, that's not gonna work. So we ended up getting there and we have some great data and I have slides on it for this afternoon to show this is one of the sp spaces in connected care for Intel that's gotten the most national recognition uh, from CMS and ONC just because of the fact that we have data to show that we've developed an interoperability model that's working, yep. so. I'd love to talk to you more about it. Yeah. Happy to. And about our Northwest Open Notes Consortium, I'd love to have you guys join that. Sure, yeah. Last question. Is there a microphone at the back with a question? If not, we have one down the front. Hi, Andy Gies from Health Tech Capital. You all have talked about the employee being the patient. What about the employee being the caregiver? Will it be for their own children or for their loved one? How do you look at the applications of startups coming to you is better tool, better productivity. I mean, there's a whole industry coming there and I don't see the employer stepping in there. All right. Who's so that for? All of you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Everybody <generous>. go. <laughs> James, do you want to yeah. tackle that first because you've sure. done all this you know, we, <laughs> third we've, party? We've had different organizations come to us in regards to elder care or other types of care for an employee who's out in the market, uh, not on the market, but out there taking care of their parents or their kids. Uh, we have not gotten there yet. Uh, our resources are now focused on our, our current healthcare system and our, our current health population within eBay and what we're doing in regards to uh, making that ecosystem work for us. Uh, it is on our list, it is on our radar, but we just haven't gotten there yet. We do have organizations that have uh, contacted us uh, and that's probably a next step for us in our evolution. We just launched a program to help uh, caregivers who are taking care of their elderly loved ones. And um, it's a support system that really connects them to resources that maybe they didn't know were available. Make sure that they also know that EAP is another option uh, where they can go and get care and some help and assistance in that regard. So. We just literally launched it a few months ago. It's another new one for us too. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I wanted to add, and I failed to mention that we do provide uh, family care leave. Uh, so right. anybody who needs to go out to take care of a member of their family, uh, we do offer it paid at 100% for 12 weeks. Wow. Uh, I think we're one of the few organizations that mm -hmm. do that uh, in the Valley. Uh, but we, we, that's like our first step. You know, hey, if you need to take care of a parent or a loved one, uh, we're going to pay you uh, for 12 weeks uh, right. for that. Uh, but outside that, we haven't made any moves in regards to partnerships with organizations that can support the employee in, in that uh, journey with their parent or their, their child or, or their relative. Thank you for that question. I do want to mention that as a group, as we were coming together around this discussion point and having various calls, um, we talked about the availability of, of ongoing resources or resources after this conversation that you might be able to access. So the folks at, um, at Medicine X will be putting up a web page to um, allow you to connect with the content um, relative to the discussion here and, and possibly Angela's deeper dive later this afternoon and, and allow you to connect with that and, and continue to get updated on, on the progress of these, of these employers and their benefit structure. So with that, I think we'll convene and, and thank you so much for your interest in this in this conversation thank you. Thank you.